This is a presentation of the paper Exponential Resolution Lower Bounds for the Weak Pigeonhole Principle over Sparse Graphs. I'm Kilian Rees, and this is joint work with Susanna Derizende, Jakob Nordström, and Dimitri Sokolov. Proof complexity is the study of certificates of unsatisfiability. So for example, can you provide me with a certificate that shows that the following CNF formula is unsatisfiable? This is in general the question of the relation between NP and CoNP. And in order to prove meaningful lower bounds, one has to restrict ourselves to a proof system whose deductive ability is restricted. And in this talk, it will be resolution, which is the arguably best studied proof system. Just to make sure that we understand each other, a literal A is a variable X or its negation. A clause is a disjunction of literals, and a CNF formula is the conjunction of clauses. We denote true by one and false by zero, and contradiction or the empty clause is denoted by bottom because it cannot be satisfied by any truth assignment. The resolution proof system consists of a single rule, namely, if you have two clauses in which a variable once appears positive and another time negative, so in our example we have z or x and d or not x, then one can derive c or d. To satisfy the unsatisfiability of a formula, one has to derive the empty clause, bottom, uh, by means of this deduction rule. And uh, proof of unsatisfiability is also a refutation which I'll work, which I'll use interchangeably. So let us look at an example of a resolution rule, how to apply it. So for example, here we have two clauses, not Z or Y and Z or Y. And applying the resolution rule on the variable Z, one can derive Y. Another example is down here where we derive Z or not Y by applying the derivation rule on the variable x and the two previous clauses. One can continue in this style to derive z or not z, and then with one more application, one can derive contradiction, which is now shows that the original formula was unsatisfiable, and this is a certificate of unsatisfiability. Good. So there are measures that we care about in resolution. And the most important one is the length of a refutation, which is just the number of clauses in a proof of unsatisfiability. In our example, this is 11. And another notion is the width of a refutation, which is the number of literals in its largest clause. In our example, this is three, as the original formula already had width three. Now the length of refuting a formula is just the minimum length required with the shortest proof, the shortest resolution proof, and the width of refuting a formula is the minimum width required to refute uh, a formula. Now there is a famous uh, relation between the width and the length, namely this is due to Ben Sassen Wigerson and says that if you can prove a linear and the number of variables lower bound on the width, then you also get an exponential length lower bound. And to be precise, like one needs that the width lower bound minus the initial width of the formula squared divided by the number of variables in the formula is like linear in the number of variables. And almost all resolution lower bounds go through this relation. So are we done? Well, no, because there are these formulas which just require less than square root number of variables width to be refuted. But we still expect them to be fairly long. And this length width trade-off is optimal, and therefore we cannot hope to improve it. So we need to resort to other means, like bottleneck counting or yeah, restriction arguments. And this is a, an interesting challenge. And, and some formulas for, for which we don't know how to prove lower bounds is, for example, the k-click formula, or for pseudorandom generator formulas, or the weak pigeonhole principle. And in this talk, we'll actually talk about the weak graph pigeonhole principle. And we will use and refine Rasporov's pseudo-width method 
which I will relate or elaborate upon in a few minutes. And my main message of this talk is that the pseudo with method is in fact a very general or very generic uh, lower bound method against resolution. And so one can, for example, also prove random CNF lower bounds using pseudo with method. And if one ever comes across a problem where the usual lower bound methods fail, maybe one could consider the pseudo width method. I hope it will be useful. Okay, but back to this talk and pigeonhole principle formula. So what is a pigeonhole principle formula? Well, it's defined over a bipartite graph with n pigeons and n holes. And we usually take more pigeons than holes, so it becomes unsatisfiable. And there is a variable for each edge with intended meaning that if the edge ij or the variable xij is set to one, then pigeon i goes to hole j. We have pigeon axioms which state that each pigeon goes into at least one hole. And we have hole axioms saying that at most one pigeon goes into each hole. Clearly, if we have more pigeons than holes, this, then this is unsatisfiable. Now, to help the proof system to refute this formula, we could add more axioms. Like, for example, we can add functionality axioms, saying that a pigeon doesn't just go to some holes, but it goes to at most one hole. Or we can add onto axioms, stating that each hole actually gets a pigeon. Now, if you look at the onto function pigeonhole principle, which consists of the functionality and the onto axioms plus the base pigeonhole principle, then this just claims that there exists a perfect matching in this bipartite graph. So we'll also denote it by perfect matching over the complete bipartite graph. So these formulas have been well studied and there's a long line of research showing exponential length lower bound for resolution. And the first one is due to Haken showing that if you have n plus one pigeons and n holes, then resolution requires exponentially long refutations. Bas and Turan later on then showed that in fact, one can even take like n squared many pigeons and this is still a very hard problem for resolution. But the case for more than n squared many pigeons has been open for a long time and by a breakthrough result due to Russ uh, showed that in fact, even if you have an exponential number of pigeons, this is still hard for resolution. And Ras then simplified the proof and uh, strengthened the result to actually also work for the onto function pigeonhole principle. So even if there are n, two to the n many pigeons and n holes, it still requires length n, like exponentially in n proofs in resolution. This is a very selective history of the pigeonhole principle in proof complexity. And there is a survey by Rasparov who where one can find many more details. Okay, so, 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 so far we have seen two ways how to help the proof system refute this formula. We can either add more axioms or we can add more pigeons. By adding more pigeons, like the formula becomes also more unsatisfiable in some sense, and it should get easier for a solution to refute. Now, another way of making it easier for resolution to refute is to restrict each pigeon's choices, right? Instead of having a complete bipartite graph, we replace it by some good, like sparse graph. Now, you don't expect every sparse graph to be hard for resolution. After all, if you have like an isolated pigeon, then it's rather easy to refute. But somehow for graphs where every small set of pigeon, every small set of pigeon has, has a lot of matchings. This should still be hard, right? Because resolution has to rule out all these matchings and this shouldn't be easy, right? So, so what is somehow a good graph? So what you want is that every small set has a lot of matchings. And this can be ensured by asking that every small set has a lot of unique neighbors. So, so every small set of pigeons has a lot of holes with precisely one neighbor in this small set. 
a bit more precise. Like we want to have an R delta C boundary expander where every pigeon has degree at most delta and all sets of pigeons of size at most R have at least C times the set size many unique neighbors. Now, one can define the pigeonhole principle over such sparse graphs. And this formula is called the graph function pigeonhole principle or the graph pigeonhole principle and has been studied before. So the first lower ones are due to Van Sassen and Vigerson, uh, who show that for rather mild expanders, uh, the graph function pigeonhole principle requires exponentially long refutations as long as you have less than n squared many pigeons. And there is one other lower bound due to Rasparov, who shows that if you have high minimum degree, say polynomial in n minimum degree on the pigeon side, then this is also hard for resolution. Clearly there is a gap, right? So if you have more than n squared many pigeons and poly log m degree, what do we know? Well, nothing so far. And this is what we will talk about. And as a motivation to, to why one should study this gap is somehow, if you look at Rasparov's uh, lower bound, then one realizes that he uses a lot of symmetry arguments. But somehow resolution is not able to, to argue like so, so global. It, it can only argue very local, right? So, so one would hope that lower bounds don't need these global arguments, but only these local arguments. So in some sense, we, we want to get rid of the, these global arguments in his lower bound and replace them by local arguments. Okay, but before diving into the proof, let us state the results. And it is that if like up to slightly super polynomial number of pigeons and logarithmic in m degree, and g being a random graph, where each pigeon picks delta many holes uniformly at random, then for so sampled graphs, the graph function pigeonhole principle is hard. It requires exponentially in them uh, long proofs. We can also show that if you go into sub-exponentially many pigeons, so if you have sub-exponentially many pigeons, you have still degree poly log n, then there are graphs so, so that the graph function pigeonhole principle requires exponentially long refutations. Though for so many pigeons, the random graphs do not have good enough expansion anymore. And we have to resort to these expander constructions due to Buruswami, Umans, and Vadan, uh, which guarantee better expansion than random graphs in this regime. Okay, as you may have guessed, these two are just corollaries of a more general statement or a general theorem, which says that if you have an excellent boundary expander, then the graph function pigeonhole principle is hard for resolution. And uh, if we recall Rasparov's lower bound, he had exponential in the minimum degree, and we now have exponential in R, where R is like the limit on the set size of the expansion. And this is somehow the right, uh, the right uh, dependency that we want. Okay, some remarks about this theorem. Uh, like one weak point is clearly that we require excellent boundary expander. Like the, the third parameter can, can at most be delta, right? And somehow as n tends to infinity, we really want delta there. And it's a nice challenge to like figure out whether this is actually also true for if we just have like a fraction, a constant fraction of delta boundary expander. So, so to say one minus epsilon times delta boundary expander, is this enough to get exponential size lower bounds? I believe it is, but unfortunately I don't know how to prove this. Also there's other things that one could improve. So for, I mean the exponent is, is not optimal, like this n to the epsilon would be nice to get rid of, but yeah. Okay, uh, also we have uh, lower bounds for the perfect matching principle, but here we require that the degree is slightly larger, nearly at least log, log squared of m, and the holes have all high degree, at least r. 
Uh, if this is given, then also here, perfect matching is hard. Resolution requires exponentially long proofs. Good. So what? Why would you study such uh, silly formula? Well, let us take a step back. So, so, so how do we prove size lower bounds for resolution? There's this general, like, random restriction, bottleneck counting arguments, or also Benson's and Vigerson can be taken into here, or there is interpolation, but then there are not many other ways of how to prove size lower bounds. And what I want to push for, or like hope that you take this away, is that pseudo width is seemingly different from the other two um, techniques, and it's very general. So, so in fact, with these local arguments, pseudo width can prove lower bounds for random CNFs, for example, or random XORs, if you want to. And if you ever come across a problem where you would like to prove resolution lower bounds and the random restriction bottlenecks and the interpolation fails, maybe consider pseudo width. I believe there should be other formulas for which this can be useful. Okay, good. So let me give a very high level proof outline. And so, so first we, we define some measure of pseudo width on clauses, which one can think of as a set, like the size of a set of interesting pigeons for each clause. And we then show that given a short refutation, a resolution refutation, we can transform this into a low pseudo width refutation. And then in a, another step, we show that, oh, but the graph function pigeonhole principle always requires large pseudo width. And so we conclude that there are no short refutations, right? Okay, before like refining this proof outline, let us uh, explain what pseudo width is or like give some intuition. So for this, consider a single pigeon. And what are interesting assignments that resolution has to rule out? Well, these are like pigeon to hole assignments where each pigeon goes to precisely one hole, right? This satisfies the pigeon axiom and functionality axiom, but clearly doesn't satisfy contradiction because no assignment satisfies contradiction. So somehow the more such assignments uh, satis that satisfy a clause, right, the, the less progress we have made. That if you look at the pigeon axioms, then all pigeon to hole assignment of pigeon i actually satisfy this uh, pigeon axiom. So, so somehow, like this seems to be an interesting number, like like d sub i of c is like the number of assignments that satisfy a clause. Now we should think of this as a notion of weakness of a clause, in the sense that if d i of c is large, then there is no progress on this pigeon i, and if it's zero, like a contradiction, for example, then we have made a lot of progress on this pigeon. Okay. So let us remember the IFC is the number of matchings of pigeon I that satisfy the clause sigma. So what is the general uh, Benzels and Vigerson way of proving resolution lower bounds? Well, they somehow also have like a, a notion of interesting pigeons. Namely, just all pigeons that are mentioned in the clause are interesting, right? And then, did, then you look at the number of pigeons that you mentioned, and this gives you a pigeon with in contrast, like pseudo width should only be the number of pigeons on which a clause has made little progress. Right? So if you look at this example, this clause, we see we have three pigeons, red, blue, and green. And somehow on, on the red pigeon, there, ah, there's only one matching on pigeon one that satisfies the clause C, right? So, so you're basically done. This is not a very interesting pigeon anymore for this clause. But pigeon two and pigeon three, like there are three and four matchings, uh, big numbers. And so, so, so these are the, the pigeons into which, which we are interested in, right? Okay, so, so, so the pseudo width, like for a given threshold, the pseudo width of a clause C are somehow all pigeons that have more than the threshold many matchings that satisfy C, right? So, so, so for, for our example clause, if we take a threshold of two, say, then the pseudo width is two. 
And if we take a threshold of three, then still two. If it would be four, then we would only have sort of width one. And note that this definition is not correct. Like we, you need a different definition, but somehow for intuition, I believe this is good enough for now. Good. Okay, so, so now we have somewhat an understanding of what pseudo width is. So let us refine the proof outline that we have seen from before. So as we remember, the first step was given a short proof, then we want to transform it into a proof of, of low pseudo width. So we look at our proof and we get some clauses that have high pseudo width and others with low pseudo width. Now, what do we do with clauses of high pseudo width? Well, the idea is to remove them from the proof, strengthen them to make them into lower width fake axioms, say, and then use those strengthenings right, in the proof. Okay, so, so, so we remove like all the red guys, and they turn into green guys. And now we add this set A to, to the set of axioms. So, so the set A is not behaving too badly, right? We assumed that the refutation was short in, at first. So, so A cannot be too large. It's definitely upper bounded by the length of the proof. Also, there is a low pseudo width refutation of the graph function pigeon hole principle with these fake axioms, right? Because each fake axiom is a strengthening of a clause removed from the proof. So instead of using the original high width clause, we can just use these fake axioms. And by doing so, the, the length of the proof will only decrease. And then in a next step, one has to show that uh, the graph function pigeonhole principle along with these fake axioms still requires large pseudo width. So the first part, I'll not talk about more. And this is because it's not a very interesting part. It's uh, almost or basically the same as Rasparov's uh, proof. And also I, I need the proper definition of pseudo width. But let us look at the last part here, which is also the most interesting part. So what do we want to prove? We want to show that if we have an excellent boundary expander, G is an excellent boundary expander, then the graph function pigeonhole principle with these fake axioms still requires high pseudo width. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I'll also ignore the fake axioms. Um, yeah, but okay, so, so, so let us recall what pseudo width is. It's somehow the, the, the set size of a set of pigeons on which the clause has made little progress. So one could, for example, look at the matchings on these pigeons that do not satisfy the clause C, right? We remember that each pigeon, each heavy pigeon, has many assignments that satisfy the clause C. So we expect there to be very few matchings that do not satisfy the clause C on the heavy pigeons. And indeed, if you check, like, the axioms have no matchings like that do not satisfy the clause C. But contradiction has like an empty set of heavy pigeons and therefore like there is a hundred percent of the matchings ruled out. So somehow this is a nice progress measure, right? But now somehow and the main claim that one wants to show is that in low pseudo width this fraction of matchings on the heavy pigeons does not increase. So somehow it remains zero as long as you're in low pseudo width, and then one has to go into high pseudo width in order to reach contradiction. And in this claim, what, what one wants to do is somehow one wants to extend matchings from the heavy pigeons to the light pigeons so that we still don't satisfy the clause C. And I mean, light pigeons have a lot of assignments that do not satisfy C, right? Like delta minus the threshold D many. So we should be fine, no? Okay, so, so let, let us look at a, an example. So we're interested in matchings on heavy pigeons. So let us look at a set of heavy pigeons here in blue. And they 
there's a matching on them and they just happen to go into the neighborhood of this one light pigeon I. Now we would like to extend the matching to this pigeon I, but clearly there is nowhere this pigeon can go to, right? Like all the holes are already occupied that it has available. So somehow, suddenly, light pigeons are constrained. So, so what do we do? Well, there is this notion of uh, closure or support, which originated in polynomial calculus lower bound, in the paper from uh, Lichnovich and Rasparov. And what they are telling us is somehow, okay, let us consider the heavy pigeons. But now, not just the heavy pigeons, like we want to add some more pigeons to the heavy pigeons. And namely, all light pigeons that may become constrained by a matching on the heavy pigeons. And these will form the set of interesting pigeons. And these are somehow the pigeons that we want to look at. So, so let us go back to the previous slide. And well, I ask whether all is good. Well, it turns out, no, it is not, right? But if instead we, of counting the fraction of matchings on the heavy pigeons that do not satisfy the quality, if we instead look at the interesting pigeons, then it turns out that it, it all works out. And somehow this is the, the main contribution of us to like, uh, to add this notion of closure to this proof so, so that we don't need this high degree argument. Like, so that every pigeon can have like this low degree and it still all works out. Okay, good. I'll not say much more about the graph function pigeon hole principle, but I want to comment like really quick on the perfect matching principle. And Rasparov already proved perfect matching uh, lower bounds. And his idea was to look at the graph and take a good cut. And then on this cut, he actually just simulates the graph function pigeon hole principle lower bounds. Asparov seems to have some good ideas, right? So let's try this as well. Well, if you look at low degree graphs, there are just no good cuts in these low degree graphs. That's unfortunate. So, so you have to somehow resort to like slightly worse cuts, but you can get around this. But then in the next step, we saw that somehow light pigeons should never be constrained, <laughs> but it just turns out that they are. And so, so the one needs uh, new ideas of this band lemma and uh, yeah good so let me wrap up uh, what's my take-home message the resolution is very well studied there are large toolbox and uh, there are already two rather gener generic uh, low bound techniques one is uh, interpolation and the other one is the bottleneck counting argument and now i hope that surwit is the third one and Maybe it can be used for other formulas like k click formulas or pseudorandom generator formulas. And yeah, another question which rises up is uh, can one extend the weak pigeonhole principle or bounds to other proof systems like polynomial calculus? Good. Thanks. That's all. <laughs>